I'm so thankful for you. I am so thankful to God for you, for your life, for your family, for the privilege of being able to gather in His name and exalt the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word says clearly in Psalm 121, verse 2, that our help comes from the Lord, you, God, who made heaven and earth. And you have your precious Holy Spirit on assignment to help unfold and breathe life on your word in our life, to find its mark in our heart. So right now, we just believe we receive the Holy Spirit's help breathing on your word, Father, that our lives would be transformed, changed, blessed, empowered from heaven above for life here on earth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're starting this new series called How to Have, part one. How to have. And this one, the subtitle is Havers and Not Havers. Havers and Not Havers. Have you ever felt a desire to have? And instead, at the end of it, you felt had, H-A-D? Maybe in a relationship, you desired to have a relationship, and yet, in the end, you felt had. Maybe it's a deal on a car or a house, renting an apartment. You want to have, but instead, at the end of the whole experience, you feel like you came out on the bottom, under the bottom even. You wanted to advance, progress, increase, but instead, you lost, fell back. You ended up decreasing. Oh, well, maybe it's just my lot in life, Pastor Stephen. Well, that's not true. In fact, it's a bold-faced lie. Maybe God's just trying to teach me something. Well, that's another lie. It's an evil religious lie. Well, some people are meant to have, and then some are just meant to be had. I guess that's me. Lie, lie, another big, fat, stinking lie. I want to show you from God's word that you were made by God to be a haver. That's God's design for you. Joshua was Moses' protege in the Bible, in the Old Testament in Genesis, and he was about to take over from Moses. Pretty big shoes to fill, I would have to say. The position was his, but the nagging concern was how to have. How do you have such a ridiculous big position with all that responsibility? This series, How to Have, is going to be ultra simple, non-religious, and very, very practical. Your immediate thought might be, well, does God really care whether I have or I get had? Does it really matter to God if I come out on top? Am I meant to be under? Maybe that's just my lot in life, to be under, stuck at the bottom. Well, Deuteronomy 28, verse 13, answers those questions directly. Listen to this. And the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only, and you shall not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and are watchful to do them. You see, when you program your GPS in the car for a destination, what's it do? It gives you turn-by-turn commands, doesn't it? Do you get offended by those commands? Of course not. The commands serve you. They serve your desire to get to the destination, to the outcome. God gives us commands, which are simply directions on how to have. I mentioned Joshua taking over for Moses. Well, he struggled with the fear of failing, coming out on the bottom, making a mess of this succession plan. Listen to God telling Joshua how to have. Joshua 1, starting at verse 7 to 8. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do everything in accordance with the entire law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may prosper and be successful wherever you go. Oh, I like that. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything everything in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful. Did you hear that? You will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful. God just said to Joshua, be strong. How? He said, listen to the commands of my GPS. What will happen? What can you expect? 
He said, you will prosper and be successful wherever you go. Now that sounds like having as opposed to being had, doesn't it? As I told you, this is a very, very practical series helping you to have in every area of life. God has the how to do that. You need to know how to have or you'll keep getting had at every turn. This goes for a career, money, health, relationships, yes, even marriage. This is going to get very practical. Just because you do something doesn't mean you actually have something. Many people do a career only to lose out on the reality of having. They ultimately get had. If you saw the movie about Judy Garland called Judy, you'd see the sad story of a woman being eaten alive by her career and her work. Famous, and yet the fame had her. She didn't have it. The drugs and alcohol had her. She was a slave to the work, to the career. Yes, she made a lot of money, but she died broke at 47 years old because she didn't know the secret of how to have. God wants you to know how to have. Think about this. You may learn to do intimacy, but if you don't know how to have, you'll destroy your future and sin against your design. Do you know how many millions of people do what they think is intimacy, but have no knowledge of how to truly have love, loyalty, peace, friendship, a marriage, a healthy mind. Think of the many famous couples in and out of the tabloids. Today, they're suing each other when only a few years ago, they were the subject of glamorous pictures and glowing write-ups of their hot romance in exotic places. But now we hear the court testimonies, the accusations, the mistrust, hatred, and finger pointing. It's plain to everyone that they didn't have love, or true intimacy, they got had. Before you do, you must learn how to have, and God is the expert on having. After all, He is love. He holds the patent on intimacy. Why freelance and get had when you can have? Let me remind you one more time what God's Word says about you in Deuteronomy 28. You shall be the head and not the tail. Above only and not beneath, you will lend to many and borrow from none. God promises that when you listen to him, he will make blessings chase you and overtake you. Deuteronomy 28 goes on and says, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. You'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out, blessed in your storehouse. That's your bank account and blessed in your basket. That's your wallet, your pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and yes, even your walk-in closet. Your enemies will come at you one way, the Bible says, and run from you seven ways. Verse 8 of that same chapter says that God will command a blessing upon you in everything you do. Are you kidding me? No, God's not kidding you. That's his will for your life, his word for your life. Let me give you this basic law of God's how to have. You've got to know the truth. I'll say it this way. God's basic GPS command on how to have is you must know the truth. The culture today teaches a fear of truth, a rewrite of history to custom fit one's narrative. This is why the straight edge of God's truth is such a threat to activism. And yet, yet it powers you up. It's the power for your life. I was a Christian believer for almost 15 years before I knew these truths of God's word and that they were for me. Isn't that sad? A believer that doesn't really know what he believes, that's so sad. Why does knowing the truth matter so much? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's a Bible-backed principle of how to have that is imperative for you and I to know. I call it the PBR principle. I use it almost every day. It works and it's based on God's truth. PBR stands for perceive, believe, receive. Perceive, believe, receive. You must perceive to believe to receive. You've got to PBR it. It's that simple and yet that difficult of a challenge for humanity because 
a hard heart will never be able to perceive and therefore never believe so they can't receive and be a haver. I say it quite often, but hear it again. Your repetition creates your persuasion. In life, there are havers and not havers. You may not like that distinction. To be candid with you, I hated that distinction as a boy and a young man. It didn't seem fair to me or nice, or in my opinion, it didn't even seem godly to me. When I was a boy and would read the Bible, I would get offended with some of the things God's word would say. Like when Jesus said in Mark 4, verse 25, for to him who has will more be given, and from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. What? Are you kidding me? That's not nice, Mr. Jesus. That doesn't seem fair to a fatherless boy being raised by a single mom with hardly two cents to rub together. Can you imagine Jesus running for Mr. President or for Prime Minister on that platform? To those that have, more will be given. To those that don't have, what they do have will be taken away. Vote for me, Jesus. <laughs> How would the media respond to that, right? You see, Jesus is giving us the answer to the lawful, eternal way out of our mess and into God's blessed. Out of our mess and into God's blessed. But our carnal nature reads that and wants to be validated instead of vindicated. We find theory safer than reality. We want empathy instead of empowerment. Do you want sympathy or do you want salvation? Stephen, you're, you're getting intensely pragmatic here. Yes, I am. This series is how to have, and it matters to God that you can feed your family and be healthy. Sympathy won't do it, so stop voting for it. We've got a whole generation being tempted to give away their future for quick validation. You're getting had, my friend. You're getting had. Getting a like on social media isn't love. Don't line up for loan forgiveness if you don't know the forgiver. If the party promising you something belongs to someone else, you'll pay for it the rest of your life. It's a spiritual law. God says, don't be deceived. Don't be had. Whatever you sow is what you will reap. You'll find that in Galatians 6, 7. How about Hosea 8, 7? It says, it's impossible to sow the wind and not reap the whirlwind. What you perceive builds on what you believe becomes more of what you receive. Do you like your outcomes? No, it's probably because you don't like what you have right now. And it's likely because you don't have a coach teaching you how to intentionally PBR. Everyone is passively PBRing their way through life, but the secret is to be intentional. Recently, I spoke with a friend who's been a baseball coach for many, many years. He scouts young talent and then coaches them. He recognizes future greatness that can barely hit the ball today or run a play. He sees extreme talent in guys who think they belong in one position but their real genius is in another position. He's had great success taking natural athleticism, strength, and hidden talent, teaching the player principles, employing repetition until it's muscle memory, and then boom, the rookie lays hold of how to have. Coach directs the player to perceive, that steers the player to believe, and now the athlete can predictably receive results. How's that for practical? The coach told me if he can even convince that kid to have a different perception on his grip of the bat, imagine that, just advance his have, it advances his PBR. What he perceives, he believes, he receives, and of course, this works negatively too. Perceive yourself as a loser, believe yourself a loser, receive the outcomes of being a loser. Now, is that too practical for us? God wants us to have life. The devil wants you to have death, and the choice is yours. The choice is mine. You alone choose what you perceive. The enemy knows that. What did I say at the beginning of this message? You've got to know the truth. Have the truth. You gotta have it. Truth begets more truth. 
Lies, on the other hand, beget more deception. You can have a lie, but I already know what you'll receive. And it's not a home run. Adjust your grip or keep getting had. A huge practical part of knowing how to have is knowing what you want to have. We all have hurts. Everyone's experienced injustice in one way or another. Are you going to let it define you? The late Dr. Robert Schuler, somebody that Pam and I got to know before he passed away, a wonderful man, he said this, let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Mm. There is no original pain, no original sin. It's all passed on, modified, multiplied, and yes, extremely offensive and shameful. That's why we all need Jesus, the Savior. But today, we're in a very practical conversation of how to have. I think these true life examples will help you better define what you have to use your faith for what you want. What you have to use your faith for what you want. Think about this. David the shepherd boy, did he have a giant enemy or was it a giant opportunity? See, it's perception. Moses, we talked about him. Was Moses stopped by the Red Sea or was he saved from Pharaoh's army, his deadly army, through the Red Sea? Think about it. Was Jerusalem surrounded by enemies or surrounded by couriers bringing gold and silver? Now, of course, I'm referring to 2 Chronicles 20 when Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat and Jerusalem were surrounded by enemies and it looked hopeless. But the truth was after God destroyed their enemies, they picked up the gold and silver for three days straight. Think about this with Daniel. You remember Daniel in the lion's den? Some thought it was the end of Daniel being in the lion's den but it actually ended up being the end of his enemies. Let's talk about mountains. Is your mountain really an obstacle needing to be removed? Or is it the staircase that wants to lift you up and promote you? Now, one more. Let me give this to you. Did the prison destroy Joseph? You remember Joseph thrown into the prison? Did the prison destroy Joseph's dream? Or was it his great palace connection? perspective. You must accurately perceive what you have. Don't be deceived. Don't curse your seed. This is a very practical principle from the lips of Jesus. To him who has, more will be given. To him who doesn't have, even what he does have will be taken away. Are you a haver or a not haver? Jesus is not inflicting a law to keep us under. He's highlighting the GPS to get us up and over. You don't fly by denying the law of gravity. It works with the law of flight. The Wright brothers, the famous Wright brothers, didn't overcome gravity by ignoring it, but by using it. Jesus is giving us a principle of life. And if you ignore it, you spend your days being a not-haver because you refuse to be corrected. I repeat, God wants you to have. Yes, he does. So don't run from godly correction because it's the source of protection and direction. Run to it. Let's run toward this principle and all of us be havers. Let me remind you again of the how-to-have principle because if you don't get this, you'll go on as a not-haver forever. I'm not just talking about stuff or equities, property or wealth. I'm talking about health, peace, joy, opportunity, laughter, relationships, forgiveness, mercy, and on and on the list goes. So no matter what it is you desire, focus on this life-changing principle one more time. You must perceive to believe to receive. Come on. How can it be that simple, Pastor Stephen? Come on. How can it be that simple? What makes you think that this is simple, right? If you don't perceive Jesus died on a cross for your sin, rose up from the grave and is alive on heaven's throne reigning as king of kings, you can't believe it. And therefore you can't receive it. Therefore you still, you're still dead in your sin under the curse of death. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? Let me give you another example, except something natural, worldly, something even Wall Street understands. In May 1997, Amazon went public and was trading at about $1.50 a share. 
That's adjusted for the stock splits that occurred over the next few years. Now, if you perceived its potential or its value as a possible good idea, you might have been living in your mom's basement in 1997, and although you wanted to move into your own bachelor apartment, that would have been a first and last month's rent, total of a whopping $500. And instead, because you perceived an opportunity, then you would have believed enough to defer your independence and instead act on buying Amazon at $1.50 a share with your 500 bucks. Now, fast forward to today. You would own a grand total of close to a million dollars. Perceiving leads to believing leads to receiving. It works for good or bad things. And not because you're either good or bad. You see, that's not got nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. It's a law, like the law of flight, like the law of gravity. You know, good people fall off a building at the same speed as evil people do. It has nothing to do with good or bad, innocent or evil. And yet when you don't understand the law of PBR, you tend to look at events of life through the lens of, well, this bad thing happened to this person, so maybe they were bad. Or even worse, this bad thing happened to this person, so maybe God just hits people with bad things to teach them a lesson or two. No, I can assure you there's many good people that have jumped to their death or fallen on the sword, so to speak, all because they didn't understand the law of PBR. What you perceive is what you believe is what you receive. That's an offensive equation for many of us because many of us don't like what we're receiving. And to reverse engineer with a sense that we're ignorant or seeing something wrong or an error, sometimes it's just so painful. So why did Jesus preface so many of his messages with repent, change your mind? Why? Because God the Father so loved you and me, he wants to help us to know how to have, how to have. Think of it. If you perceive hopelessness, you believe hopelessness, and you receive hopelessness. It's not very good, is it? We have far too many people hopeless because their perception of truth is blurred, darkened, and twisted by so many false beliefs. You must know the truth. You must have the truth. I spoke with a great man the other day. He said, Stephen, I've got a problem. No matter what I receive, no matter how much I get, it just goes. It just goes away. I can't seem to keep it. I can't seem to have it. Now, this is a great guy. He loves his wife and his family. He's a hard worker, diligent, honest. But like so many of us, he's struggling with the how to have. Not to be selfish or stingy, because this guy's a giver. As we talked about it, it became apparent his problem wasn't receiving, but the root perceiving. That's right. He perceived himself as the source, not God. He saw himself as also the problem not God's guy. What you perceive determines what you believe, decides what you receive. God cannot be your source if you perceive yourself as the source. When you substitute you for God, or anything else for that matter, it's a hard road to go down. God will help you look after, sustain, and maintain whatever He blesses you with. Isn't that good news? Understand this, you can be a haver in one area, but be a not-haver in the other. Here's the problem with ignorance. Life becomes random. You don't know why something works here, but then you don't seem to understand how to make it work over there. You seem to know how to have money, but you can't seem to have a marriage. You can have a career, but I can't seem to have peace, so you keep falling into addiction. You can have casual friends, but you can't seem to have real trustworthy friends. That's a problem. You can be a haver in one area of life and then a not haver in another area. I've seen people that learn to recognize and be thankful for their health and their heartbeat, giving God glory for that, but then they don't apply the same principle to things like money, opportunity, or even their children or marriage. They tell me that they have, but their words and actions tell me that they don't have. For example, when you have kids, you celebrate that reality and you don't constantly try to figure out ways to run away from the responsibility. You don't defer what should be done today because you 
you have kids, not just as a responsibility, but you perceive them as a gift. Now you believe them to be a gift and you receive the power for the gift. You see, it starts with fixing your perception. Let me show you what I mean here. Here is how you truly have something. Number one, ask God to help you see. Perceive what you really have. You see, the natural state of humanity is to be blind to their blessings. For example, if you can see with your eyes, when was the last time you were thankful for your eyesight? Because there are a lot of blind people that would give just about anything, anything and everything to enjoy what you take for granted. Ask God to help you see, to truly perceive what it is you really possess. Number two, be thankful. That's right, express it, speak it out loud. Give someone credit for what you have. Is it wealth, wisdom, pennies, a heartbeat, a room with a view, another day to live, a moment or two without pain, half of a sandwich to eat? Give somebody credit, thanks, appreciation, and turn it into a celebration. Give the Creator the credit due unto Him. If you haven't been giving God credit, I say this with a gentle heart that's set on helping you turn your life around. You're actually robbing God. God deserves all the credit and all the glory. So number two, be thankful. Be thankful, sister. Be thankful, my brother. And then number three, stop magnifying the problem. Stop using your words to talk about what you don't have, what you wish you didn't have, how empty the glass is. Stop all the not have or talk. You don't have a million dollars? Well, do you have a heartbeat? I know some dead people that were once very rich and your heartbeat is worth more than all their past wealth. They love one more chance to recognize God's grace before they left this mortality. You're rich. But if you're too busy magnifying the problem, you'll never see the light, the solutions. Put your hand up over your eye. Do you see the room or do you see your fingers? What's bigger, the room or your fingers? Many people live life only to die never seeing the promised land because they're focused on the wrong thing. That's not God's desire for you, but we must perceive to believe to receive. Even God can't break that law for you. That's how to have. Oh, I know this is super practical. Hear the heart of the Father. He really wants you to know how to have. With God's help, we're gonna keep this series light on theology and heavy on practicality. There are difficult times coming, but good news, God's word is unfailing and these principles work even in the middle of inflation or deflation, in the middle of rampant crime and falling supply chains. Praise God, his supply chain never fails and that's why he wants you to know how to be a haver. For the next few parts, I'm gonna help you use this truth to specialize in key areas. Part two, you've gotta get this because it specializes on relationships. How to have good relationships, that's essential. Part three is how to have good communication. Look, too many even Christians join the choir, join the prayer team, and post on some social media platform, but don't know how to have good communication. No, no, this is gonna save your marriage, keep your kids from going crazy, help you keep your job and fix your constant friend turnover quotient. No, not all your friends have been crazy. You need a communication tune-up. And then part four, we will be talking about how to have stuff. And yes, Jesus actually wants you to know how to have stuff because if you don't, it'll hijack your life. You've been listening these past minutes on what Jesus says about how to have and your heart's probably crying out for help right now. Stephen, I, I just wanna know how to have God's help. You need God's mercy, forgiveness right now. Oh, you're at the right place at the right time, my friend. Let's look at what Jesus says right here in closing. Matthew 11, starting at verse 28. He, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. Jesus is teaching us all how to be havers. He's saying, take my way upon you. Learn from me. I don't want you burdened and heavy. No, but able to rest, to be refreshed. 
His yoke connects us to the truth and so that we're able to perceive. When you learn from Jesus, you learn how to believe, but it doesn't stop there. You learn how to receive. Come to Jesus. Perceive, believe, and now receive. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need a Savior. You've already paid the price. You died on the cross for me. You rose up from the grave. You promised me everlasting life. I see it now. God loves me. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Now I'm a child of God. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.